All right, this is gonna be fun. Um, so I just found my old, um, what I called Big Rump, my remote mix panel. Um, I made this, gosh, um, maybe 12 years ago now. Uh, it was around 2008 or 2009. Uh, I don't think iPads were around or maybe the iPad had just come out, but uh, the LS9 that I had been working with and the O1V did not have iPad apps at the time. And um, a lot of people were using tablets and stuff like that for Studio Manager uh, to control remotely. We hit needed two computers, it was a complicated thing. So I decided to make a little button panel that emulated a keyboard and I ran software on it that, uh, oh, that one's kind of stuck, that would do multiple key or mouse movements so that I could select channels and things like that. Oh, man, this is filthy. That's all rusted. I haven't seen this in a while. I've been, I've been wanting to cut it up and um, salvage these buttons, but I haven't been able to bring myself to do it. Uh, but now I decided to make a video, uh, kind of tearing the thing down, and um, just for my own nostalgia. Um, maybe I'll watch it later after I've already cut this thing apart. So uh, me and uh, a dear friend of mine, Mike Mazaros, helped me build this box. Uh, he did the woodwork. Uh, I made the panel out of, um, it looks like a rack panel, but it is slightly smaller. Or it might be slightly, no, it's slightly wider. But um, the thing was that uh, I just grabbed a piece of sheet metal at a Home Depot type store and I drilled all these holes um, by hand. I didn't use any kind of uh, specialized tools. I just kind of lined them up with a ruler and so you can see they're slightly off. Um, I didn't care. It doesn't matter really. It was just a, ma a, a way of making it all work. So uh, what these buttons did was um, I had select buttons 1 through 16. This is first 8, second 8 and I spaced them wide enough to put a strip of tape there. Remember board tape? So you'd write your, your channels on it, um, and then this was 1 through 16. If I press this button, the, and this was meant to work in companion with another screen. Um, it's funny, I ended up building that uh, other panel uh, with faders running mixing station for the X32. This is kind of the proto version of that. Um, so anyway, the every button would do a mouse press to select. I'm going to hopefully try and find the software so I can show that to you because it was a kludge. Wow, the amount of steps I went just to like select a channel, I think it was like four mouse clicks. Uh, and there was no way of sending MIDI, at least the MIDI that I was able to send. This is before I learned all more about that. But um, there were sysx commands you could send the Yamaha, but I didn't have a way to send that. So, um, and then, ah, gee whiz, this was I think on off. And then this was more volume, less volume is one dB at a time. Very clicky buttons. Um, so in a quiet performance, I'm doing a lot of mixing. It sure made a lot of noise. Um, and then what were these buttons here? Gosh, I don't even know. These might have been um, aux sends selects. Uh, I don't, this might have been stereo and mono. I have no idea. I hopefully have the software so I can run it. Anyway, let's go ahead and open this thing up. So what I did was uh, I took an old USB keyboard. This was from, I learned about it on like Instructables or one of those kind of websites, uh, like a DIY type website. And you take the keyboard part, the uh, circuit board where the USB cable comes in and right before it breaks out into the grid of the keys, it all comes to one central point and you can wire things to that uh, to do key presses. So every one of these buttons was just a keyboard key press. Wow, I cannot get that out. Um, let's take it out on the back. So I put a nice little uh, Neutrik USB uh, connector there and on a big old panel because this was all I had available and I really didn't know as much about um, black box building and uh, doing little projects like this, but it it's held up. I mean, this thing is, uh, I used it for a number of years. It went on a deployment to the Middle East with me, and it worked great. Uh, it survived everywhere, so I don't, I, I, I mean, I don't know how I could have built it much better other than, you know, 
higher quality tools or doing uh, other bits uh, as far as getting this buttons in alignment or maybe um, do backlighting. And I just, I didn't understand it at the time. I've since done a lot more and I still don't understand it, but you know, it is what it is. So I thought I might be able to pop in there and push it up. So there's just the USB cable from the keyboard passing through. Let's see if I can push that panel up. I can feel all the wires sticking out of it. Just enough to catch it. Oh boy, that is in there. Oh, there it comes. Oh yeah. Look at this rat's nest. So, oh yeah, no wonder it was so much easier to work with. Um, so I made a couple other of these USB keyboards, but uh, or these type of things, or controllers, but you can see I wired all these little wires to it and they all kind of jump to one additional thing. Let me get my other camera so we can see all this. So here we go with a better view. I'm gonna just take this out. So there's the big buttons. And you can see it all wires to this thing wrapped in blue electrical tape, high quality, I'm telling you. Uh, and then all these little connectors here, you can see this bottom row just loops one to the next because they all shared one connector on the keyboard. Um, so the other connector would vary the key. So, uh, you know, this is probably like, let's see here, like this might be J, this might be L, this might be the space bar. I really have no idea. I think I did trace out page down and page up, which were the DB commands, but um, they were also passing through somewhere else. So, um, man, I, I really hope I could find that software. Anyway, uh, so that's how it all worked. It was pretty cool. I thought I was, um, I was pretty slick showing up with this in a laptop. Um, I would usually put the laptop either on a little keyboard stand and have this in my lap. Um, doing a lot of like summer outdoor type things. That doesn't go there. This one does. And um, it was cool. I was remote mixing um, on a laptop. And, I, you know, I know a lot of guys were using tablets back then, but uh, I honestly was a lot, I didn't have any money. I, I was working for the military band and uh, this, that was the gear that I had on hand and they weren't going to buy me another tablet anytime soon. They had just given me the laptop. So, and, uh, so I went along and built this and it worked out okay, uh, at least for just basic functions. It was a start and just a fun little project got me started on building more stuff like this. So anyway, I'll put this back together and hopefully find the software. Oh, excuse me. Uh, hopefully find the software so I can show you it in action. And I'm hoping it all still works. It's, uh, it's a little grody, but it still works. Uh, hopefully it still all works fine. I found the software for the Big Rump console and um, I've loaded up Studio, Studio Manager with the LS9 editor. Um, and not all the buttons work so far, but it's pretty good. So you can see here, I'm going to try and do a split view. Uh, we can go to channel, that's channel 1, channel 2. And I enabled a second cursor so you can see it moving. 3 doesn't seem to work. 4 works. And you can see it jumping up to the select button. And then it actually goes up to the select button, down to the top of the fader to tap the fader. You can see it kind of jump back up. And that selects the fader so that these buttons work. And then um, this is the on off. It's just a mouse click, I think, from the waiting position. So if I was to hit, you know, channel two, turn it off. Uh, that was the quickest way I had uh, with the, um, the computer I was using. So it was, it was very difficult to... Um, do things quickly when I needed to just grab something and turn it up or down. So um, usually once I'm going to move the mouse just to make this a little faster. Um, the idea was once the mix was kind of going, I could then page through these and just kind of do small tweaks and, and just while I'm sitting there, everything's kind of sitting where I want. So if I go here, you can see it goes up a dB at a time uh, based on the position it's in. I don't think it's going to stop at zero, but it's, oh, it's a half dB at a time. Oh, 
What a pain in the ass. Uh, all right, let's see here. So can I go yeah. so I can just jump there. And it made it very, um, made it feel kind of fun because it was arcade buttons um, and you're just mashing on them to turn it up. Uh, it's such a silly thing. Uh, let's see here. So then this was the second. Oh, that, that seemed to do something. 12 worked. I guess all the keys. Oh, so that these four are actually the stereo returns for uh, effects returns. One works, two does not. Three does and four does. That's cool. Then the on off. I can change the faders. Neat. So these two, I think, were the stereo mono. Yep, that's where it is. So the whole thing, this whole thing pivoted on me having the windows in the exact right position on my computer. So this, all this um, scripting was written very specifically for my setup, which is ridiculous. Um, looking back at it, it's just absurd. But, um, you know, it worked and it was fun. Uh, but I'll have you, have you take a quick look at the script here. I'm going to turn it off. Uh, this was a program called Glove PIE, um, and it would uh, take over inputs or would do whatever, do additional commands if I did something. And um, it also worked with the uh, Wii remote from the Nintendo Wii, and you could, I, I actually made a controller out of that. That was my original first project, learning with the uh, scripting. Uh, if I can find that, that would be amazing. I have the software, but... I don't know how to hook up the Wii remote anymore. Um, anyway, you can make that cursor disappear here if this is gone. Uh, it says cursor to visible. Uh, and then there's just a bunch of scripting. So it says if pressed this key, then do X these things. So I had to say cursor to to XY position at that little button based on the pixel position of the screen size that I was running. So that's why it doesn't quite line up the way I had it. Um, and then do this, like click, and then move here and click. It, it, it's just so asking for failure. I, I just, I can't believe it worked at all. But, um, you know, and then I think there was a screen reset command. Oh, I turned it off. That's right. Let's look at it one more time. So on here, there was a screen reset that would put me back to where I needed to be, at least with all the windows. There it goes. So if I was to close this, I think it brings it back. Yep, sure does. But not in the position where I'd want it. I don't know. I don't know where this was living. It may have been like here. And then I would just um, adjust over here with, the, oh, geez. So if I'd come over here, I'd adjust with the mouse um, with a scroll, which this mouse does not have a scroll wheel. So, oh, well. Um, Anyway, you could just mouse over it and, and use the scroll wheel and it would turn. So between a mouse and having this on my left hand and then a mouse in my right, it worked really, really well. Oh, I remember I had a handheld trackpad. Um, I'm going to cut here and I'll find that. That uh, I was using, it was a handheld trackball um, that had all these extra buttons on it. Um, no software. It was at, you know, I forget where I even found it. I was on the road somewhere and just saw this it was just such a goofy looking mouse and i just i wanted to play around with it and i ended up building this controller kind of around that so you can see whenever i'd move around and then i'd have a separate scroll scroll wheel that wasn't anywhere near the mouse so i could sit there and turn knobs like this and i can go here and go okay it was kind of a touch and turn thing um because you can kind of mouse and i made the mouse real hard to move you had to really flick it to get it going somewhere and but um, you had a lot more precision in here. So I can go here and grab the EQ very easily. Um, it made it a little easier to interact with this software. Um, this is all, bef again, before I had the LS9 stage mix. But, I mean, shoot, I could do, like, I want to select channel 1 or 2, turn it on, and turn on its high-pass filter. Boom, done. I mean, it's pretty darn quick once you get it. And I haven't used this in a long time. So imagine if I had been using it for a while, you get even faster. So um, aside of being ugly and kind of kludgy and the software prone to failure, I mean, it really made mixing remotely a lot smoother, a lot smoother experience rather than trying to use a little pen on a tiny little like Microsoft, um, or not a Microsoft, but I don't know, the 
tab the touchscreen tablets at the time that ran Windows were just insanely hard to control, uh, like any kind of tablet would be today. Um, so it, it just made it a whole lot cooler to mix on, and it was you know it was an external controller in a place where it was all being put on software. Super cool. I mean, you had actual fun buttons to press, and they're joystick buttons. Like that's super fun. But look, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't make it so it doesn't repeat, so you can't crank the uh, volume too quickly. It's like a one-shot. But boy, it would take forever to get something turned up. But I guess I, if I'm mixing on my mouse as well, yeah, I can rock, do that for quick adjustments. And then this was just for kind of staying in an overview position. But all I had was uh, select, mute, up, down. Enough. You get it. It's just a cool little project I had, and I'm, I'm really just talking about it so I can watch it again later when I want to remember this thing. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for uh, letting me indulge myself here.